Well, good afternoon. Thank you for coming today. Uh, my name is Ryan Streeter. I'm the Director of Domestic Policy Studies here at AEI, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this timely and interesting discussion about uh, viewpoint diversity on college campuses uh, in America. Uh, they've been in the news a lot lately um, as students and faculty have gone beyond expressing disagreement with viewpoints they, they don't um, agree with to trying to prevent those views from being expressed. At least these things have gotten high level attention. Uh, AEI's own Charles Murray uh, plopped on the national stage in early March when, this, when he was shouted down and prevented from talking at, at Middlebury College. Um, we, just a few weeks later, uh, James Otteson at Wake Forest University ran into something similar. We've seen the Berkeley protests uh, just this past week at Duke University. We've seen uh, the reaction to a sharply worded email criticizing a training session. And these, as these uh, events pop into the news cycle, uh, it creates an impression that something has fundamentally changed on our campuses. And so if you're wondering whether something has or is changing uh, with regard to diversity of viewpoints and the willingness or unwillingness to hear them on campuses, you've come to the right place today. Um, we uh, we want to know what's going on. Is this really about uh, right, left viewpoint diversity or something deeper going on? Jonathan Haidt at New York University has written that there's two types of universities now. There's t the two, two types of telosses, or teloi, if you're really uh, good with your Greek. Uh, there's the truth telos, there's the social justice telos. Is that what's going on? Is there something, is there something deeper at, at play here? Are things as disjointed as they seem on college campuses, or are these just new manifestations of older tendencies on college campuses? We'll get into some of those issues and more today with our distinguished panel. And so what I'd like to do now is uh, turn it over to our moderator and host for the day, uh, Pete Peterson, who's the Dean of the School of Public Policy at Pepperdine University, who will introduce our speakers and moderate the discussion that follows. Uh, uh, Pete is a leading authority on issues related to civic engagement and public participation uh, and the use of technology to make government more responsive and transparent. Uh, he was the first executive director of Common Sense California, which in 2010 joined with the Davenport Institute at Pepperdine University to form the Daver Davenport Institute for Public Engagement and Civic Leadership. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce Pete to you and, and uh, welcome you again to this interesting panel today. Pete, the floor is yours. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much, Ryan, and thank you all at AEI. It's been a real pleasure to partner with you all in this very important discussion, which is actually the third of a series of panels we've been doing around the country on this very issue. At first glance, there might not seem to be too much in common between the American Enterprise Institute here in Washington, D.C., and the School of Public Policy at Pepperdine, which is situated in the beautiful cliffs overlooking the Pacific Ocean. But when you look at the Venn diagram of the relationships between people in common that have served in both of our institutions, then uh, many commonalities come into focus. Uh, from uh, Michael Novak, who served here as a fellow for many years and was one of our founding faculty, to Steve Hayward, who was also a fellow here and also just recently one of our visiting faculty. Jack Kemp was also one of our uh, founders, really at the School of Public Policy and was also very involved here. But it's the late James Q. Wilson who most closely connects us while also connecting us to this afternoon's conversation. Wilson, who served here on the Council of Academic Advisors, was not only our founding Ronald Reagan Professor of Public Policy back in the late 90s, teaching our students for most of the last dozen years of his life, he was also a founder of our program. He shaped our unique liberal, liberal arts curriculum, believing that graduate policy programs had become too technocratic and students needed to be exposed to all of the social sciences, not just the supposedly quantitative ones, in order to be better well-rounded public leaders and policymakers. In his obituary of Wilson for the New York Times in March of 2012, the paper's Bruce Weber described Wilson as, quote, an avowed conservative arguing, for example, that strict punishment of criminals, including the death penalty, has a deterrent effect on crime. But, Weber allowed, even his critics acknowledged that th he was less an ideologue than a scientist. He concludes the piece with Wilson's own words, Wilson saying, quote, I know my political ideas affect how I write, but I've tried to follow the facts wherever they land. 
Every topic I've written about begins as a question, and I can honestly say I didn't know the answers to those questions when I began looking into them. Can this be said of the social sciences today? Do we as citizens have a real sense of the viewpoints considered in the creation of social science research? To say that higher education has, is left-leaning politically is to utter a non sequitur. But to quantify it, to say that there are more self-described Marxists than Republicans in the field of sociology, for example, and to personalize it, to tell the stories of the right-of-center professors having their research discounted by academic journals, these are the inconvenient truths told by Professor John Shields and his co-author Josh Dunn in their recent book, Passing on the Right, Conservative Professors in the Progressive University. Published by Oxford University Press, the book is a compilation of 150 interviews with self-described conservative social science faculty around the United States. As a sign of the current conditions for right-of-center academics in America, the names of all the interviewees are kept confidential, as are the universities and colleges where they work. But chapter five in the book begins this way, and I quote, our first interviews brought us to a paradise for right-wing academics. Its Edenic campus sprawls up a mountain just above a seaside town, where the ocean sweeps out of the horizon and dominates every vista. As we peered out over the mountains and blue waters, as we began to suspect that with the protected sanctuaries like this one, the plight of conservative academics could not be all that bad. Ladies and gentlemen, I have news to break here as long as you promise to keep it confidential. That Edenic campus where this book began is the Pepperdine School of Public Policy. So we're excited to co-host what is today the third of a national tour of conversations on this issue. And without further ado, I'd like to welcome up John Shields to provide our opening remarks. John. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Pete, for the uh, gracious introduction and uh, for organizing this. Thanks to AEI as well. Thanks to my uh, distinguished group of uh, conservative professors uh, who uh, uh, are gonna on this panel today. Uh, well, as many of you know, um, uh, conservatives are not too common in academia. In fact, we are uh, scarcer, uh, uh, conservatives are scarcer in academia than they are in any other major profession. Uh, including Hollywood, and we're especially scarce in the social sciences and in the humanities. As Pete just suggested, um, uh, we're even scarcer than, than Marxist. Uh, while 18% of social scientists self-identify as Marxist, about 5% of social scientists self-identify as conservatives. As one of my colleagues quipped, there are more Marxists in faculty lounges these days than in the Kremlin. <laughs> Conservatives are um, even less well represented in the prof professoriate than all current targets of, affir of affirmative action, including Latinos and blacks. In fact, as, as Sam, Sam Abrams has shown recently, uh, the percentage of conservative professors has been declining in the university since the early 1990s even as the number of Latinos and African-American professors has edged upwards. So while the academy has become more racially diverse, it's also become less politically diverse. Uh, conservatives also tend to cluster into certain areas, uh, especially in, in economics, and that leaves other areas of the social sciences practically with, with, with hardly any conservatives at all. Uh, take sociology, for example. There are about 5,000 sociologists in this country, yet after searching uh, for months, my co-author and I managed to identify a total, a grand total, of 12 conservative sociologists. And actually, we thought that was pretty good. You know, we weren't, we weren't sure we were going to get to 12. So today I want to talk about, uh, briefly, about why we should uh, be concerned about these stark and growing imbalances in the university. And first, I'm going to talk about a little bit about research. Then I'm going to talk about teaching. And then I'm going to make a few suggestions uh, that might improve this situation. Um, so to begin, why does 
political diversity matter for research? I think the first thing to note about our case for more viewpoint diversity in higher education is that it's different in some important respects from the more familiar case for more gender diversity in, in, in higher ed. Uh, feminists worry about the representation of women in the natural sciences and STEM fields, I think largely because they want to correct the long-standing assumption that men are better in those areas. But proponents of viewpoint diversity aren't all that concerned about the natural sciences, at least most of the natural sciences. They're certainly not concerned about math or engineering. Um, if every engineer in the country was a Marxist, no one would protest. Right? It would be regarded as a strange and curious fact about engineering, to be sure, but few would worry that engineering was being taught from a Marxist slant uh, or that engineering research was being done in a Marxist way. There would be no David Horowitz barnstorming the country, raising holy hell about the lack of political diversity in higher education. I think the same goes for a whole number of fields, uh, mathematics, physics, computer science, chemistry. So generally speaking, I'm worried almost exclusively about disciplines in the social sciences and humanities because politics falls so close to the subjects of inquiry in those areas. Uh, for this reason, the late, um, the, the late great uh, Marty Lipset called the social sciences the political sciences. And this seems like an obvious point, and it should be, but in many cases, uh, when I've given this kind of talk, progressive professors come to me and say, well, gee, you know, I know a few conservatives over in the en engineering school or over in the math department. Um, not only is that not reassuring to me, indeed, I think it's part of the problem, right? Um, I think the problem for proponents of viewpoint diversity is that conservatives tend to gravitate into fields where they matter most, right? Um, they do so partly because they're more welcome there, and they're more welcome there, I think, because politics just doesn't matter that much in those areas. In fact, conservatives are relatively well represented in many areas of the natural sciences. Um, take electrical engineering, for example. In electrical engineering, conservatives outnumber liberals by a ratio of three to one. Right? Who knew? Right? Uh, almost nobody because it just doesn't matter all that much. Um, it's also not the case that all areas of social sciences would benefit from more diversity. Uh, I think some subfields in the social sciences are so technical and so removed from politics that it just wouldn't matter that much if there were more conservatives in them. Uh, the study of game theory in political science is a good example. I don't think the that field would change very much if there were more conservatives, right? It would still be just as strange and unreadable if there were more conservatives. So instead, I think political diversity matters in those areas of common concern to the right and the left, uh, such as the study of race and gender, inequality, religion, abortion, welfare, affirmative action, uh, the list goes on. And the problem is, is that in many of these areas, there are very few conservatives. Um, so if there were more conservatives in those areas, I think it would improve social science for a couple of reasons. Um, First, I think it would just generate a much broader range of research questions and interpretations. Okay? And I think you can appreciate this tendency even if you focus on the way, uh, even if you focus on the ways in which intellectual movements on the left have um, reshaped uh, knowledge in the university, right? So think about uh, in the 1970s, there were lots of women who entered the university and they brought lots of new research questions with them and interpretations with them. Um, and they studied topics that had long been neglected by their predecessors, especially the study of gender. Um, now, I know of no liberal professor who would say, that's not true, right? Who would say, no, actually, you know, the entry of women into the university just didn't matter that much. Uh, it really didn't change uh, what we think we know about the world. Um, it was just insignificant. But if that's true, right, if, if women and feminists broadened so the social sciences and improved it in certain ways, why wouldn't more conservatives and Burkeans and libertarians do the same? Right. I also think that... Um, Diverse intellectual communities are better at seeking the truth 
because of the tenacious power of confirmation bias. And confirmation bias is simply the tendency of all of us to accept findings and theories that fit our pre-existing views and to reject those evidence and theories that don't. Um, we all try to be as objective as possible, but norms of objectivity, though they can be powerful, um, are not powerful enough to check confirmation bias because confirmation bias is just so deeply wired and rooted in our nature. And because this is true, we can't rely on our fellow partisans to tell us what's wrong with our own thinking, and we can't rely on them to fairly assess arguments on the other side. This, of course, is not a novel argument or new argument. As John Stuart Mill argued long ago, if we want to confront arguments in their most plausible and persuasive form, it helps to hear them from persons who actually believe them, who defend them in earnest, and who do their utmost for them. Right. Thus, I think the problem in a way with the university is not that it suffers from political bias. Political biases, after all, they reflect intellectual orientations and they're deeply rooted in our nature. So I don't think that the problem exactly is that there's, you know, there's political bias in the university. I think the problem is, there's, is that there's just one kind of them. Right? The problem in the way is that there's not enough political bias in the university. I'd like to see more varied biases in the university. Okay, I want to say a few words about um, students. I know that students are very much probably on your mind. Certainly they're on my mind these days. Um, certainly many on the right um, are concerned that students are being indoctrinated by the left. Uh, in his ill-fated um, campaign, Marco Rubio called colleges indoctrination camps. Uh, I think the problem with those kinds of claims is that they overstate the power of professors. You know, they give them too much credit, and they wrongly suggest that uh, young people are weak-minded. Okay? I do think that there are too many professors who do, in fact, try to indoctrinate their students, but in gen generally speaking, I don't think they're very good at it. Okay? So I don't think, for example, that conservative students are routinely being converted into Bernie Sandinistas, right, or something like this. Instead, I think the deeper problem is that conservatives tend to avoid both classes and majors in the social sciences and, and in, in the humanities. In fact, politics is among the very best predictor of undergraduates' um, uh, major choice, with conservatives gravitating toward the natural sciences and liberals and progressives uh, heading toward the social sciences and humanities. And this um, early sort of tracking, of course, really affects the PhD pipeline problem down the road, right? Where conservatives are sort of being directed, I think, and steered away from the social sciences and the humanities. Um, the other problem is that classrooms are often not that politically diverse as a, re as a result, right? Even if the campus has some real diversity, classrooms often don't reflect that because students are sorting themselves into very different majors. Um, um, I think that um, this is a shame because the university, uh, it seems to me, is one of the few institutions that can better prepare students for lives, as, for better prepare students for their lives as citizens by exposing them to civil and respectful debates across the political spectrum. And I think that's really critical in, in the coarsening political environment that, that we're living in today. One study, for example, found that at least a third of parents would be very upset if their son or daughter married somebody from the opposite party. Universities could be a corrective to that kind of polarization by providing a more deliberative model, but that's hard to do if there aren't any conservative professors on campus. Right? Um, sometimes there are, of course, and uh, that's a great thing because professors can provide this model. I think a great example of this is at Princeton University where the conservative Robbie George co-teaches a class with Cornell West, and I think they each pick half the books. And uh, this has actually been an inspiration to me. In the, in the wake of the Heather McDonald protest, I reached out to a leftist sociologist, and I said, let's teach a class together, and we'll just assign books by disinvited authors, and, we'll, and these authors will be from uh, across the political spectrum, and we're, I think we're gonna call it the university blacklist or something like this. So. Yes, so we're going to do it. We're going to do it. Um, 
if there were more conservatives in the social sciences, I, I think students would also be exposed to a much broader range of ideas. I think it's surprisingly, maybe not so surprising to you, but it's certainly very easy to get an elite education these days without being exposed to conservative political and social thought. Uh, consider the case of Jonathan Haidt, actually. Uh, he described um, his shock at discovering conservative ideas for the first time long after he left college. Um, and he said, you know, as a lifelong liberal, uh, he said, I, I always assumed that conservatism equals orthodoxy equals religion equals, equals re uh, rejection of science. But while browsing in a used bookstore, he picked up a copy of Jerry Mueller's volume on conservatism. And when he got to about the third page, he had to sit down. Right? He was quite literally floored by the discovery that there was a kind of conservatism that could, that could compete with liberalism in the court of social science. Um, as he put it, um, you know, he, he didn't become a conservative, but he did start to appreciate his in, it, its insights. As he put it, I began to see that conservatives had attained a crucial insight into the sociology of morality that I had never encountered before. And that was the line that particularly grabbed me, right? He just, he had never encountered it. Um, and I think it's very uh, hard to imagine this happening in reverse, right? Where a prominent conservative professor uh, discovers liberalism, right? Uh, well after leaving college, right? It's, uh, uh, I think li liberal and leftist ideas saturate our intellectual discourse too much for that to happen. Um, so if there were more conservative professors, I think students would encounter volumes like Mueller's much more often than they do now. And it, um, liberals, um, liberals might also be benefited in an, benefit from this in another way. Um, they might be less upset by ideas they disagree with. Uh, Jonathan Haidt recently put this well. He says, uh, he, he asked in a rhetorical way, he says, do you know why uh, peanut allergies are rising? Because we haven't exposed children to peanuts. Um, so by sheltering liberal students from uncomfortable ideas, um, we have essentially made them allergic to them. Right? And this is perhaps why a recent survey at Dartmouth College found that a majority of liberal students there said they would be uncomfortable having a conservative roommate. And of course, I think conservative students would uh, benefit from having at least some center-right uh, professors on campus too. Uh, as it stands now, I think they're essentially being raised by wolves. Right? And that is to say, without any serious right-wing mentors, they often turn to the populist personalities they find on television and the radio and then mimic that populist style in their activism on campus. And they need, they need more than that, right? They need intellectual mentors who can guide, direct them, and deepen their politics in a serious way. Okay, I wanna say just a final quick word about what can be done about all this. Um, I think a lot of things short of affirmative action for conservatives. I think PhD programs, especially very, um, in very leftist disciplines like history and sociology, could signal that they, they, they'd like to see more conservative graduate students, that they're eager to mentor them. Um, I think that uh, professors uh, should be encouraged to diversify their, their syllabi. Um, I think hiring too uh, could be, um, I, I think colleges could be encouraged to hire in areas outside of um, outside of areas that are sort of dominated by the left, so they might uh, do more hiring in areas like ancient history, military history, religion, law, the American founding. Um, if there were a moratorium on hiring in race and gender, right, for a few years, uh, I think there would still be an overrepresentation, right, of people in the social sciences studying race and gender. Um, there could be more co-teaching. Uh, I th I, again, I think the West, uh, Robbie George model is a great example. Um, there also could be visiting exchange programs. I think this is sort of an interesting idea. That is, uh, what if more conservative schools and, uh, uh, um, basically just swap professors for a year or two with uh, their liberal counterparts, right? So what if conservative Hillsdale sent somebody, uh, one of their professors to Williams, and, you know, Williams could send back a Marxist right into Hillsdale, which would be kind of fun. Um, uh, George Mason's law school, right, could summon someone to USC, and, and uh, 
Uh, because some schools uh, and programs are sanctuaries for conservatives, they might export them, right, to institutions that are less diverse. And finally, I think conservatives need to be careful um, not to overstate the university's intolerance. I think this is important too. Um, and um, I think that if they overstate it, the danger is that they'll push conservatives, young conservatives, away from this vocation. Right? And that seems like a real danger, especially in this age when there's a lot of craziness going on on campus. And that's true, right? And that needs to be reckoned with. Um, but it's also the case um, that um, conservatives can succeed and thrive in academia. And my concern these days is that message may be lost in, uh, on young people. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I want to introduce uh, Sam Abrams, my uh, colleague and partner at Heterodox Academy. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Can everyone hear me? This is so uh, this is a book, Passing on the Right, that I would have liked to have written, uh, meaning it is that good and that important, and I am very, very grateful that uh, Oxford published it and that you and, and uh, your colleague actually took the time to put this uh, down on paper. And I say that because while many of us in the academy are well aware of what's going on and feel isolated and feel rejected in, in higher education in many respects, it's nice to hear stories and as a data nerd myself to see a larger sample size, to actually see a couple hundred professors as you gathered share in these stories provides us with a, with a little bit of comfort and it, it's nice to see a more formal sort of attack. One thing I say to my students is, look, uh, one case doesn't indicate a movement, one case doesn't indicate a systemic problem. Interviewing hundreds of folks across as many disciplines as you did indicates that there's a systemic problem beyond things in the aggregate. So thank you very much for doing that. Uh, so it, uh, I'm, uh, in addition to being at Heterodox, I'm a professor at Sarah Lawrence College. I'm going to be very brief. Our classes usually are two to three hours long, so I can talk all day. I'll try not uh, to do that at all. Uh, so on uh, the train down, I, I thought quite a bit about this book. Uh, I've been thinking about this book for over a year now since it came out, and, and quite a bit has been written and quite about a bit has been said about um, the arguments. So what can I do to sort of expand on that and, and just, uh, you know, bring some color to it? And, you know, on a very personal level, I couldn't agree more with what... Um, John is saying about what it feels like to be a conservative professor in academia, especially at a small liberal arts college like Sarah Lawrence, which is famous for being incredibly progressive, incredibly left, and uh, pretty much one-sided. I can say that comfortably now as a tenured professor. Uh, it is something I didn't say regularly prior to that. Uh, so, you know, what, what happened prior to tenure? Well, I, I censored myself regularly. and. Uh, Faculty tend to do that around the country. I can't stress that enough. Folks who are freedom friendly don't share their actual thoughts uh, in writing or with their students. Students regularly record everything and tweet everything, put things up on YouTube. You have to be very careful with that. Um, I felt like I was dishonest some of the time. Uh, I was very, very lucky when I was an undergrad to be at Stanford and uh, spent a lot of time at the Hoover Institution. Uh, I was blessed, quite frankly, to be able to hang out with people like Milton Friedman and Gary Becker. Uh, I spent a lot of time with them. They told me incredible stories. These are stories I was not able to share and push back on uh, among my colleagues in, in the faculty lounge or dining room or with my students for fear that there could be some uh, consequence uh, for that. Uh, if you think back to being in middle school or high school where it's awkward and there are cliques and things of that sort, uh, that's what it felt like for the first uh, five years of being a professor where if you saw a group of faculty talking, uh, you know, on the other side of the quad or something like that and you wanted to come up to them and approach them, you could feel that you were rejected. They would turn away. I would not be included on things. I would find out that folks had gotten together and, and I was just systemically uh, excluded. Uh, that was okay, quite frankly, because I live in New York and I have plenty of other social connections in New York, but I can imagine, quite frankly, if you're in a smaller environment where you really don't have a larger community, that that can be incredibly challenging and uh, very, very painful, quite frankly, to live in. Uh, so, you know, the short of it is being a conservative and freedom-friendly type of professor at a small liberal arts college is frustrating, was lonely, and exhausting, and it remains all of those things. Again, being in New York and being able to spend time with, with this panel and, and here at AI, that certainly uh, does help. So, 
some things to add to, to John's narrative, uh, and this is not a crit criticism of the book whatsoever. I, I'm very grateful that, it, that you wrote it the way you did. But after a while, um, you know, being a PhD holding guy, I, I didn't like hiding all the time. I didn't like sort of falling into line and teaching what Sarah Lawrence and, and you know, sort of the lefty world wanted me to teach. So you sort of develop subtle forms of resistance to use a progressive way of thinking, you know, resist, resist, right? So gradually, you know, you realize you can teach some things that are a little different. So uh, a course that I expected to have a lot of trouble with was called Reagan, Thatcher, and the Politics of the 1980s. I expected that course to be protested. I didn't expect people to want to take that course. It was oversubscribed, and the students absolutely loved it. Uh, we did it in a mixed media form. There was material, culture, political stuff, economic history, and it was a wonderful way to introduce ideas that Ronald Reagan and his team had, as well as what uh, Margaret Thatcher was thinking. And quite frankly, you could bring in work from various economists, various uh, diplomats, and, and things of that sort. And the students' guard went, were down because they didn't see it as particularly lefty or righty. It was more of a historical work. And suddenly, they found that they were really curious. I know that teaching this course infuriated my uh, colleagues in sociology and economics at Sarah Lawrence because they started to ask about uh, classical and neoclassical economics. They wanted to know more about what they just weren't being exposed to. So that was um, quite pleasant. Another form of uh, resistance is to actually force transparency. So I teach a course called Polarization in Public Policy. And every time I have a book, I, I try to describe it as, a, you know, this is a conservative work or this is a liberal work. This is a libertarian work. This is a progressive work. Who's writing it and why did they write it? So if we're looking at a question of public policy, housing, upward mobility, and, you know, we're going to teach a book by Barbara Einreich, you sure you know, believe you better believe that I'm going to make sure they read uh, a Charles Murray book uh, right along with it, uh, expose what those biases are, and uh, limit people from attacking them on the basis of the, just the author. And this way, they're forced to deal with the ideas. And that was a very um, effective way of doing it. Same thing. You know, every time students want to bring up a Paul Krugman point, no problem. We'll talk about a Thomas Sowell point or a Milton Friedman point. And uh, that tended to be um, a good way of doing it. The way I actually start all of my courses is with a quote from uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan. Very hard for students to argue that I can't mention Moynihan uh, on a college campus. And the, uh, and the quote is, is actually, I have a plaque now in my office, which says, everyone's entitled to his own opinion, but not his own facts. Being at Sarah Lawrence, that might be his or her or their own opinion, uh, not his or her or their own facts. But uh, you know, that's sort of a mantra. And it's, it's, again, very, very effective because I just say, I'm not going to put up with, you know, the, the ignoring, you know, being, I'm not going to put up with ignoring facts. Our goals are figuring out what the facts are, and then you can build up your opinion based on those facts. But it's very important we know what those facts um, are. Another way to talk, another thing I like to do is, quite frankly, reference the mission of places like Sarah Lawrence and most other schools and universities have similar ones, which are about civility, promotion of diversity, accountability for what you state, and an openness to dialogue, discourse, and ideas. And when students try to shut down conversations and faculty try to shut down conversations, it's very, very important to say, look, this is against our very mission, our very existence. To your point is, we need to have a diversity of ideas. We need people to share various viewpoints. And this is how we move forward and how we make progress as a society. So uh, that tends to work uh, very well. Additionally, um, over the last couple of years, I've spent a lot of time trying to formally measure what's been going on uh, on college campuses with students and professors and the like. And one thing that's very, very clear is that in the last decade, it's the faculty that have moved sharp left, not the students. When students first get to college campuses, we have very good data on this. UCLA actually surveys almost every incoming college freshman. Uh, when I did it, it used to be a big SAT style white paper. Now it's all digital, of course. But what we discovered very quickly is that the average entering freshman is soft left. They're a little left of center, but they're not particularly progressive and they're not hard left whatsoever. It's that the faculty tend to be hard left in many, many fields. And the faculty exert a tremendous amount of influence over the classroom, as well as over the politics and, quite frankly, discourse that we see on a lot of college campuses. So about influence, if you spend time with students and you actually force them to consider you have a right to your own opinion, but let's figure out what the facts are, it's pretty remarkable how quickly the students eat that up. They like this, 
they want this. I've been fortunate enough to try this strategy at uh, scores of universities and colleges around the country. And if you know your stuff and you're comfortable with the arguments and you say, but look, let's look at it this way. Let's lay this idea out compared to this other idea. Students don't immediately reject it. Some do. But I think there's an opening here, especially for those of us who are uh, right of center. And it requires spending a little bit more time with our students, a little bit more work teaching and not as much research. That's a, that's a big taboo on most universities. But the, the, the reality is I think we can move uh, students and uh, one of my greatest points of pride is the fact that I have dozens and dozens and dozens of students who have gone off to graduate school at LSE, Notre Dame, University of Chicago, Pepperdine, quite frankly. I'm very jealous that they're at Pepperdine. It's, it's beautiful there. Uh, so it can work and, and before I got to Sarah Lawrence, the idea of someone doing degrees that may not be completely left of center is, is shocking and, and they're doing it and uh, it, it's very, very rewarding to see. Uh, final point, and then I'd like to open it up to everyone since this is a great panel, is that I, I've also been fortunate enough to be able to get some good data on professors. And quite frankly, are they, you know, their levels of happiness and are they comfortable being professors? Uh, are they enjoying themselves? And much to my shock, conservative and uh, right of center and libertarian professors are actually happier in the academy than left-leaning faculty. Uh, and, and the question is, is why? Well, let me get back to that in a second. But, um, you know, one thing that I think that has emerged in the last couple of years is that there's in-group versus out-group bias. Uh, I, for one, love being on the out-group at Sarah Lawrence now that I, I'm tenured. I like uh, prodding people. I like bringing in speakers that are going to annoy people and say, here's an interesting idea. You really need to listen to it. And if you protest it, you're a hypocrite. People can't handle that. They don't like being told you're full of it. I shouldn't say that, but it's something you can say to your colleagues once you have tenure and to other students and say, you want me to hear your position? I'm happy to do it. Now you need to hear mine. There's actually a lot of pleasure that I think uh, I and other uh, faculty take. Um, another thing is that um, thanks to social media, that social networks are very real. Um, people talk, uh, you know, since we have some heterodox people here. Our listserv is fantastic, and I love knowing you're there. I love hearing uh, from you. Uh, I spam it a little much, uh, but, uh, or used to. And then finally, quite frankly, there are some very important groups at the undergraduate level. Uh, Institute for Humane Studies, the Liberty Fund, uh, Charles Koch Foundation, uh, Heterodox on the faculty side, which a number of us are uh, heavily involved in and helped start. And uh, these create very important social networks and communities. And when you know that there are resources out there, whether they're legal resources, intellectual resources, or quite frankly, just social resources where you can get a drink with someone and schmooze, that's a nice New York word, uh, about these things in a, um, to use a lefty word, safe environment, it's, it's a lot of fun. So why are uh, faculty um, on the right happy? And then I'll stop talking. Well, we're able to be, I think, intellectually honest, and I think we're there to support each other. One thing that I've noticed on the left is that social justice is a form of teaching, and, a, and it's hard to decouple those. And at least at places like Sarah Lawrence, one of the things that left of, left of center faculty are struggling with is who can be more progressive, who can be more politically correct, is their teaching good enough? Are they being active enough? Are they doing enough? And quite frankly, pre-tenure, that can scare quite a lot of people and make them very on edge. Are they liberal enough? You know, you watch folks left of center, quite frankly, cannibalize themselves. When I was a graduate student at Harvard, uh, the Kennedy School was full of this, and you watched left of center people just eat each other for lunch. That was uh, hard to watch. I think in the conservative uh, side of things, we have our ideas, we are much more supportive, and uh, the data seems to suggest uh, all of that. So I wanted to just share some of those thoughts to tack them onto your fantastic book. I think all of uh, the findings in the book are, are quite frankly, dead on. Um, I wish they weren't, but I, I couldn't agree more, and over the last year, your book has motivated a lot of the, this new empirical work to sort of further flush out some of the things you were finding. So thank you for writing it. And uh, Pete, sorry. Thank you, Sam. Sure. Uh, so let's get to our panel, introducing them first, uh, starting from my right, your left. Uh, professor Gerard Alexander is an associate professor at the University of Virginia at the Woodrow Wilson Department of Politics. He is also a consultant for the Serial Freedom Trust here in Washington. Professor Elliot Cohen is the Robert E. Osgood Professor at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies where he also directs the Philip Merrill Center for Strategic Studies. Uh, you know Sam, 
Professor Jim Gimple is a professor of political science within the Department of Government and Politics at the University of Maryland, where the tagline I noticed is to be civil. Last but not least, Professor Sam Goldman is an assistant professor of political science at the George Washington University, where he also leads their politics and values program for outstanding first year students. Please welcome our panel. So I want to take us through three lenses uh, in looking at this issue of viewpoint diversity. First students, then faculty, and then the products of the research that come out of social science research. Um, first is students, and it's been covered somewhat in John, your remarks, and also Sam, your response. But in a New York Times piece uh, just from Monday of this week titled Life and Combat for Republicans of Berkeley, one Cal student, 19-year-old Patrick Boldy, is quoted as saying, quote, you have a lot of professors who hold some very liberal views, and you can sometimes feel not necessarily marginalized, but like you're being penalized when you express a more conservative view. Like in my sociology class, I wrote an essay on the good aspects of gentrification in San Francisco. I was heavily crit criticized by my professor. And as you've said, John, it's, it's not an... It's, it's too much to oversell this so-called, uh, these indoctrination camps, to uh, use, again, uh, Marco Rubio's phrase. But let's delve a little bit deeper into the impact that viewpoint diversity is having uh, on students, and particularly conservative students. And Gerard, if we could start with you on the impact uh, that it's having on students. If it's not actually indoctrinating them, taking someone who's conservative and turning them liberal, are there other ways that it that this environment is impacting our conservative students. Sure. Um, uh, happy to talk to it and happy to be here. Thank you for, for organizing this and to AEI for hosting it. Um, like Sam, I uh, celebrate um, John and his co-author, Josh Dunn's book. Um, I'm one of the many uh, uh, anonymous interviewees who figures in it, although by then, like Sam, now I have tenure, so I didn't mind actually being on the record. Um, but I understand why, uh, why he, they chose anonymity as the, as the offer to all the interviewees. Um, on, on the subject of students, I'm going to say something that is going to uh, reappear when I think we get to the research part. And I, I think it does dovetail with something that John suggested a few minutes ago, which is that the problem isn't what is discussed. The problem is what's not discussed. Uh, I, I'm delighted at many of the speakers who come to my own campus and many other campuses. I'm happy to see lots of the courses being taught that are taught. The problem is what's missing from curricula, what's missing from classrooms. Um, and I think that has some effect, uh, se several effects. And I think John is absolutely right that we, one ought not to be, one ought not to exaggerate this. There's problem enough that it doesn't need exaggeration. Um, I have long, um, in the spirit of annoying my colleagues, as, uh, as Sam likes to do, I have long said that the problem in political science is that most professors are not insidious, is that most of them are, most of the, the things they work on and write about are insipid. Um, they're just extremely obscure, they're technical, they're just not particularly creative, particularly intellectually ambitious. Um, and I think m it is really a minority of professors and of courses that really fit that description of a kind of indoctrination camp. It's, um, uh, it, it isn't the norm. Um, but there is some of it. Um, it's tolerated. Uh, and we've seen in the last few years on a slew of campuses that the minute anyone tries to set up a center or offer a few courses that sound a little indoctrination-y from the right, that leads to hue and cry over, you know, that the scholarly enterprise is being infested with political agendas, that people's values are being injected. Into the, and notice, mm. th though, that none of that is matters when it's um, left of center or even hard left agendas, centers, um, entire fields of study that define themselves as having political goals, that are, it's built, it's, you know, it's in their DNA that they're pursuing political agendas. That's okay. And if it's okay for some and it's not okay for others, that helps set some mood on campus. And the mood isn't one of indoctrination, but it is one of bias. It is one of tilt. And students are not idiots. Um, students get this. And to the extent they're self-sorting in terms of their majors, that's, a, uh, I think, one indication of that. I see evidence of that in my own department, um, which is one of the biggest majors on campus. But nonetheless, takes on a political coloration as students start to self-sort for all kinds of reasons. Um, let me tell an anecdote. Um, 
you didn't tell me how long you wanted us to talk, so I'm just going to quickly. Um, so uh, we have a lot I'll, of panelists I'll, here. I'll, sure. I'll tell you an anecdote from when I first began teaching. I was in graduate school, um, wanted badly to have, for my CV to have some teaching experience on it, and when a nearby liberal arts college had a, a course that needed an adjunct for a semester, um, I happily taught it, and I taught it as a series of debates between um, uh, conservatives and liberals in the post-war United States. And I had a cluster of students who were particularly engaged with the class, particularly motivated, um, politically diverse themselves, and. And um, several of them started to hang out with me after class and get the proverbial beer with a professor and finally started asking me what was my own take on all those debates that we were reading about. And I'm, you know, I, I was then, as I have been ever since, pretty coy about that. I just don't know that that plays a constructive role in the classroom itself. It might on campus and other venues, but not in the room, in the classroom. Um, and finally, uh, a few of the students said that they betted I was a Republican. And I wanted to know why they thought that. And they said, and I really am not making this up, I'm not exaggerating this. Um, the entire course was built around really one-for-one -one conversations between sort of good faith takes on both conservative and liberal views on things. And that really made them wonder. That made them very suspicious, not suspicious <laughs> in the negative sense, but it made them wonder. They were, that was not the norm in their other classes. And it made them wonder whether if I was going to that much trouble, what did it say about me, right? And um, I, I, I wish I were making that up. I know it's just too, sort of a too-good-to-be-true story, which is why I'm still telling it all these years later. <laughs> but it, it, it does signal powerful things. It makes yeah. the PhD production pipeline, as John suggested, incredibly self-reinforcing of academia's existing tilt. And um, I know very few students who don't get that while they're sort of welcome on campus and views of diverse kinds are welcome to varying degrees on campus, there is no doubt in their minds that in the social sciences and the humanities that the faculty itself is a kind of guild and that that guild has right. a, a very predominant tilts in American politics, and they suspect that the highly subjective nature of being admitted into that guild um, is a gauntlet that they're not sure it makes sense for them to run. And I think that that's a deeply pernicious influence. Dr. Cohen, your, your thoughts on the issue? You're in a particular discipline in, in foreign policy. Right. But um, so first, uh, I'm also delighted to be here. Uh, Jim Wilson was uh, one of my teachers, and mm. uh, I, I still think of him very fondly. Um, I should also say at the outset, I'm an outlier here. I teach at a graduate school of international relations just down the block. Uh, and during my career, I've been kind of politically isolated and I have nothing to complain about. Okay? I've never been persecuted. Um, I, I've always felt a little bit like that, uh, along the lines of what you were saying, a little bit like that sergeant from the 101st uh, Airborne Division, who was in Bastogne during the Battle of the Bulge. I prefer to fight surrounded. Um, and, and, you know, I want to dwell on that a little bit. Um, you know, listening to that quote from that kid at Berkeley, yeah. if he got a bad grade because of what he said, then there's a problem. If he just got a lot of criticism, he was lucky. Hmm. A lot luckier than the kid who said whatever it was that the professor wanted to hear and didn't get criticism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what strikes me, and I, I mean, I do go out into normal kinds of campuses, is um, it's it, in many places, not all, and, and, and I do think it's very important to remember there are a lot of different pieces to academe, and it's a mistake to, to generalize about it. Right. I, I feel that quite strongly. But in a lot of places, we're not teaching students to be tough-minded. And this can actually happen to the conservative kids, too, who easily relapse actually into the same thing that their liberal or left counterparts are doing, which is a posture of martyrdom. You know, my feelings are hurt. I'm, I'm in a minority. Uh, people are not being nice to me. And, and I do think it is our job as teachers, I know it's certainly my job as teachers, to toughen them up. And that's that, I think, is something that can be missed in all this. And although I, I'm also, I'm a great admirer of, of, the, of the book and the work of Heterodox Academy, I do worry a little bit that we will confuse, we, we, we could end up with a bunch of super sensitive conservatives on campus <laughs> who won't be quite as numerous as the super sensitive leftists, but frankly, from the point of view of citizenship, they're equally worthless. <laughs> You know, actually, uh, Dr. Cohen, that, that reminds me, I'm, the, the last panel like this we did was in San Francisco back in, in January, and we had um, panelists from uh, Stanford and Cal, 
And one of the Cal panelists was Michael McConnell from Stanford Law School. And one of the points that he made, and I just wanted to quote from this uh, from a couple months ago, uh, he said, quote, the greatest victims of intellectual homogeneity are the liberal students, adding a liberal student can go to an elite law school and never be challenged on their worldview. Um, Jim, I wondered your thoughts there. You know, obviously this can be seen in both ways. Uh, the challenging environment for conservatives, can, uh, conservative students, again, just really focusing now at the student level, can be seen as a great preparation. Uh, but at the same time, as John has seen, and I think Sam has also seen in his research, uh, the pipeline is narrowing for conservatives than pursuing careers or lives in academia. Well, I, I think that, it, that your prospects in, uh, in going into academia as a conservative hinge to some extent on your interests. Um, you know, I have a lot of the same interests as a lot of my liberal colleagues, you know, very ordinary questions of political behavior and elections and election outcomes and fundraising. And uh, I don't find that what I do is all that politicized. I mean, there are some people in my research venue that maybe emphasize race as a motivation for public opinion and, and behavior. There are others who would emphasize uh, the economic roots of, of uh, behavior and opinion. But, you know, I, I have tried to steer uh, the, my students uh, into uh, higher uh, degree levels, you know, in academia uh, by reassuring them that they can be conservative and have the same interests that a lot of their liberal colleagues have. That it's okay, right? <laughs> that you don't have to, you know, go on to, to graduate school uh, and to be a conservative uh, right about the Second Amendment or um, the superiority of free markets or school choice. Uh, you don't have to write about the evils of big government or uh, provide, like Charles Murray does, individualistic accounts of poverty versus structural ones. You can be a conservative and have a lot of the same interests as your liberal colleagues. Absolutely you can. And I've been there for 25 years, hmm. okay, in a rather ordinary public institution. And it's not been horrible, okay? <laughs> it's not been that bad. Um, and uh, so, you know, I, I have sent a number of students on to graduate school, very good graduate schools. Um, some of them are now... Uh, having very successful careers in academia. I've also sent some liberal ones on. And what I've discovered is a lot of them, when they're in their second or third year of undergrad, haven't really given higher education and academic careers too much thought. And you know, there aren't that many of us, after all. And so, you know, if you're growing up uh, in central Maryland or in southeastern Pennsylvania, you know, how many academics do you know by age 18, age 19? How many of you met? You know, how many of your parents had over for, for dinner, right? Probably not very many, okay? And so they don't really consider uh, being a professor because they've never encountered one before coming to college, right? And so when I plant that, you know, seed in their mind, you know, when they're 19, 20 years old, it may well be the first time they've ever considered it. Right, um, and so, um, and and as I said, some of my most successful students. One of them, Andrew Reeves, is recently tenured at WashU in St. Louis. Um, writes on the same things that a lot of his liberal colleagues write. You know, the, the the distributive politics of the executive branch and disaster aid declarations. Right, and uh, he's conservative. He's a Republican, but it's okay, right? It's okay to have rather ordinary interests that all the rest of the field seems to be interested in as well. You know, I don't have to be a, a conservative. Uh, to be a conservative in academia, I don't have to write about the things that occupy the people at Heritage or at Cato or, or here. Mm. Is that shocking? <laughs> <laughs> Sam, you engage with uh, Sam Goldman. You engage with with freshmen and first years. Your thoughts on on the impact of, of viewpoint diversity on on students, and and maybe if there is any self selection going on to engage with your with your first year student group. 
Well, my, my students are uh, a select group, and I don't know how representative they may be of students at uh, other universities or even in other programs uh, at GW, um, but they are um, already extremely interested in politics uh, and um, see themselves as committed to really quite a variety um, of, of ideological and political positions. So one of my tasks is actually to encourage them to look beyond our conventional distinctions between liberal or progressive and conservative or left and right, um, and to consider a much wider range of political possibilities um, that have been suggested and discussed through the centuries and millennia. So what, what I worry about is less representation of, of conservatives or viewpoint diversity in a narrowly ideological sense than the threat to what I would describe as real liberal education. Um, the idea that by reflecting rationally on our condition. We can liberate ourselves from our prejudices and find the truth. And of course, um, encounters with conservative faculty and conservative ideas is part of that, but there's, there's more at stake. Um, so although my students have some idea of what I believe because they use the internet and because I wear a necktie, which I think is an infallible um, indicator uh, of, of uh, political position. Um, it's the knit necktie in particular. Well, that's a, f that's a fine distinction. You could probably <laughs> place me even more precisely um, by, by that means. Um, really, what I do in, in classes um, is play devil's advocate, not to say Socrates, and to try to reveal as best I can the um, limits or weak points of, um, of their ideas, whether they're liberal or conservative ideas. Um, so I, I agree with a lot of what's been said so far, and I think that would be much less likely to occur if there were even fewer conservatives on faculties than there already are. Um, but I, I worry sometimes that a focus on political diversity distracts us from our real purpose, the real purpose of, of scholarship, um, which, is, which is pedagogical, which is teaching, um, not to organize debates and certainly not to indoctrinate, but to encourage students to reach their own conclusions, um, whatever that may be. As Ryan said in the introduction here, one of the, one of the topic areas in which viewpoint diversity falls under has been the number of protests that are going on on campus. Um, and I think in some ways, two things are being conflated here that shouldn't be conflated. Uh, what is going on inside the classroom and what is happening outside the classroom. Um, in these protests, which if you look at them on a case-by-case -case basis have individual and unique histories. There are outside groups involved in some of these. Some of them, for example, in the Middlebury case, it actually involved professors with students. There are some in which uh, I know in the case in Claremont when uh, faculty from, not from Claremont, but from other neighboring schools were involved in this as well. Um, I want to talk uh, first to you, John Shields, a little bit about uh, separating these two. Um, the fact that some are, are making a, a rather logical uh, connection between the protests that we're seeing of the Ann Coulters of this world uh, in Berkeley, for example, and the subject of viewpoint diversity and, and where there are places of agreement that what we're seeing may be a manifestation of what's going on inside the classroom and what in some ways they really should be held apart. Well, the, the protests are, um, I mean, it's, it's interesting. I mean, they're, they're almost entirely happening at very selective elite universities. And I think it's because there is something about uh, the culture, the moral culture of those institutions uh, so, uh, that encourages those kinds of protests. So uh, to some degree, I think the fact that you get protests, um, when you get sort of protest, it does tell us something about the institution. Um, on the other hand, I also think that there's places that are trying to um, 
uh, encourage or facilitate a wide range of views by inviting right conservatives in in the first place. That's why they got invited. Um, and um, then are sort of overrun by activists, uh, by these movements that they didn't anticipate, or sometimes these activists are sort of coming from the outside. I mean, certainly that was the case at Claremont McKenna. Uh, very few of our own students participated in the Heather McDonald protest. Uh, it was true at Berkeley. And so if I'm, you know, if I'm a small elite liberal arts college that uh, has a, a big protest, um, the danger is, is they might decide, well, we're just gonna stop inviting these people, right? And so, um, uh, and, and that would be a shame, right? Mm -hmm. So my, my concern is, um, and, and I think we need to be careful about not assuming that just because a campus experiences uh, a, a protest, that therefore means that that place is some kind of Orwellian nightmare, right? I, I just think that's, that's certainly not true at Claremont McKenna, where students get, I think, a very good education. The, the, our, even our humanities people are, uh, you know, they're not postmodern Foucault, Foucaultians, you know, they, they read good, they read classic books. And, um, and if you just read the, the Wall Street Journal, you wouldn't know that actually about the place. Um, and so somehow I think our public conversation needs to be more sensitive to the, to the, the, the more, comp the, there's some complexity here. If I, I could just yeah. pick up on this. I think you're making a very important point about the Wall Street Journal view mm. uh, and rendition of what's going on in the campuses. And I think it's extremely destructive mm. because it is so completely unnuanced and it basically leads mm -hmm. to people staking out a position where they think all universities are worthless and indeed the academic life right. is worthless. Mm. Right. And you know, that's, I think that was also uh, your point as well. And it's, it's not true. In the long run, it's dangerous because at the end of that, what is left on the right other than craziness? Mm. Sam? Yeah, Avery, uh, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I also think that as, as some of us had uh, talked about before the panel, this has also led to donors pulling their support for a lot of research and a lot of the sort of centers and places where the conservative ideas can actually occur, where we have spaces and, and resources for scholars to write, quite frankly. I, I've been complaining quite a bit, tried to write a piece for the Wall Street Journal, they declined it, about the fact that the, the folks on the left, New America Foundation and others, are um, funding lots of scholarship right now to promote these ideas. People like Anne-Marie Slaughter are promoting that. I don't see balance on the right whatsoever, and, and I think it's a very, very dangerous thing for us to sort of punt, and I wish the Wall Street Journal would be a little bit more balanced about that. We have good ideas, we need to start using them, uh, and you're right, I, I would hate to cede this ground to people on total, you know, craziness, so. Any other thoughts about the protests and the connections to uh, the subject of viewpoint diversity? Well, it's worth uh, considering, I think, whether, um, Jonathan Haidt's idea that the social justice university um, is confronting the university devoted to truth. Um, that may be partly correct, but I think misses part of the picture. Um, there's also what you might call the customer service university. And a lot of the protests and unsatisfactory responses to them recently have revolved not around the faculty, but around um, university administrators. Um, whose job isn't to teach or to provoke, but in many cases to keep customers happy. Um, and if the political and intellectual left has some responsibility for the corruption introduced by the idea of social justice, I think conservatives and people on the right have some responsibility for um, encouraging an ethos of community, uh, of, of customer service um, that can be turned against uh, free expression and open debate. The, one of the, the subjects that we've covered here is that while many looking at college and seeing it from the outside, seeing its ideological bent, uh, are not taking that deeper step of also understanding what appears to be true in the research you've done, John, and also Sam Abrams, you've done, to show that this is actually a growing problem that as you look at this from an age demographic standpoint, that the faculty continue to be moving further left over time. Uh, when I was an undergraduate right here at George Washington, yay, 30 years ago, 
I felt like I had a fairly balanced faculty between conservatives and moderates and liberals, and I really never felt that kind of, some of the stories that I've seen now speaking to today's college students. Uh, so maybe Sam Abrams with you to talk a little bit about the issue that this, this is something that's, that's growing uh, and something that really does need to be addressed because of that. Sure. Uh, you know, and it's funny, in the 1960s, people thought that the universities were dominated by radicals. Hofstadter wrote quite a bit that, you know, it's, it's the lefty faculty who are dominant, and, and the empirics actually just don't show that. It, it's actually been this sharp left of uh, millennials and uh, end of Gen Xers, actually, who have, in, in my view, and, and I'm trying to get de more serious data on that, who really do see academia as a corrective profession now to right certain wrongs, as, as other panelists have said. Social activism and social justice is written into the very ethos of certain departments and, and certain intersectional studies, certain multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary studies, uh, gender studies, women's studies, all the things that you know, I'm fortunate enough to see deeply at, at Sarah Lawrence uh, and, and other schools. And uh, this has led to you know, a lot of the faculty seeing it as their mission to educate and then correct, and it's very hard to decouple uh, that. Mm. Um, one of the things that, that I have struggled with, and I think a lot of uh, empirical younger faculty struggle with, uh, again, goes back to resources. When I talk about sending students off to graduate school, I, I worry about, again, how they're going to get jobs. We certainly talked about that. But let's say they do get the job. If they're not theorists, and that's not a knock to theorists whatsoever, and you actually need resources to go do your work, it's, it's getting harder and harder to sort of find those resources as well. And I think that's part of the dialogue that we're, we're not having. Um, places like Russell Sage in New York are all but close to someone like me. They have a very clear set of, what the, uh, of requirements of what they're looking for, a type of person they want, and a type of question they want that fits into sort of this leftist uh, agenda. There is no comparable thing uh, on the right. So not only do we see this imbalance, but it's, it's becoming, a, again, a big sorting effect. We're seeing more and more sorting out, and it's harder than ever uh, to get people in. You know, I'm, I'm thrilled Andrew was uh, able to get tenure. I'm thrilled he made it. Um, that's, it's wonderful, but um, I, I worry that there, you know, if someone came to me who's right of center, I would say, go to law school. Go do well, something I, else. I, I would say that the reason why conservatives fail uh, to make progress in uh, you know, their ambition to, to stay in academia, it's complicated. It can be for a lot of reasons. Sometimes they're just not very good, okay, <laughs> honestly. And, and sometimes the, the, there isn't enough work, right, when they come up for tenure. They haven't done enough. Okay, now I don't know if that's sloth or they just chose the wrong career. Okay, but it's easy to, you know, to make ideology an excuse when that's not really the reason, okay, that they've been denied, all right, tenure. Um, I think sometimes it's temperament. You know, again, I caution my students who are going on to, to PhD programs to not be so strident. Uh, and again, to be willing to consider working in research areas that their liberal colleagues are working on, that are maybe not so highly politicized. Um, you know, don't gravitate to all the hot button issues where you're going to get in trouble. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Sometimes you can develop a great deal of passion for some empirical area of inquiry and have a very nice career around it. So, Jim, I, 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 I'm sympathetic uh, to, the, to the broad argument you're making, but isn't it a problem if conservatives systematically avoid the hot button topics? Uh, I mean, how many conservatives do you I, know, you know I, studying race in I, I, politics I, or gender in I, politics? I think that there's a tremendous opportunity for influence uh, on your students in the mentor-student relationship. So much of your influence as a professor is developed in personal relationships with the students and with your graduate students, with your undergraduates. It's not in the classroom at all. Mm -hmm. And you know that's how they know me, okay, as a church-going conservative Republican. Okay, it's not from what I teach in class, okay. Um, and you know that's often where the the influence is. It's not so much in the classroom at all. But, but sure. let, let me but let me pick up on John's point. Uh, let, me, let me let me cut off John and make his point. Um, uh, the, 
you know, there, I, 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 think I, I think I don't agree with your, your broader point, Jim, just to be antagonistic. Um, in, in a couple of senses. First, and, and this is, maybe I'm pushing this further than John wanted to take it. You said, and you're quite right, conservative uh, would be, you know, graduate students or would be academics don't have to study the Second Amendment. They don't have to study the superiority of free market. The problem is not that they don't have to. The problem is that they also mustn't. That's the problem, is that there are entire research areas that at least at the beginning of your career, prior to getting tenure, you really shouldn't do. Now, I often tell students of mine who are considering going on to graduate school or when I meet conservative and libertarian students who are graduate students, I often tell them, work in research areas that are already you know, common within your discipline, and if you can't find one that you're interested in and that your discipline is interested in, at least as your initial project, then that says something more about you than it does about um, other things. On the other hand, that I think we ought to admit as two political scientists, Jim, that's easy for us to say because there is a lot of political science that is relatively apolitical, doesn't sound like the right word here, but that isn't reflective of a you know, deeply ideological nature. Now try go and get that PhD in sociology or comparative literature or anthropology or there go and try to find that really neutral thing that isn't offensive to you but that it isn't, you know, there it's a lot harder. Political science, probably among the social sciences, economics aside, is probably the, the easiest of, to say that of, as opposed to ones where it would be almost impossible for a conservative to find something that isn't a real gut-wrencher for them that is acceptable within their discipline. We're all political scientists. I think that's Are we all political? That's well, a, I'm, that's I'm, a, I'm, I'm a renegade. So. I'm now an historian. <laughs> um, I, I just got... Well, but you know, in a way, that's, this is part of the issue. I mean, I think it, it, we have to separate out the issue of one's of uh, politics, politics, as opposed to what's happened to some of the disciplines, and there's a, there's definitely overlap, and you know I can talk to that in both history, and to uh, to some extent in political science, but we need to distinguish between those those two. I think. You know, the other th thing that I'll I'll say is, uh, and and as a young scholar, you ha you unfortunately you do have to, you know, work roughly within the mainstream of whatever your discipline is. Now. The, Thing is, at the end of that, there's tenure, but of course, by the time you get to tenure, you may have turned into one of the pod people yourself, and so, <laughs> you know, you're not going to be able to... Or you're just to, incredibly to, heavily invested in other research areas. Right. But, but the, the one thing I would say is, um, there is something to be said for tenure, and conservatives now right. benefit, yeah. I think, from the protections of tenure Absolutely. in ways which I never would have, right. I never would have thought... Right. Uh, would be the case, and it, and it is important Panthers to remind ourselves. Make very that. clear that we do not want to abolish tenure. Right, right. No, right. So all, all the all the conservatives. Please, in not the room, I retire. Right. All the conservatives in the room should oppose tenure for K through 12 and support it uh, in higher ed. There's nothing inconsistent I, I, about that position. I, I, I just want to. I, I want to emphasize on the on the back end of this, and feel free to move on. That that sometimes it's, it it sounds as if well, you know, if you move on to uh, an issue uh, to study that is maybe less partisan or less highly politicized, you've made some tremendous concession to your true self. Hmm. Okay? No, 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 no. Absolutely not. There are lots of things that you can develop a great deal of passion about, okay, that are not super highly politicized, that are not super highly partisan, and they will contribute to a very nice career for you. Mm -hmm. I, I agree at the individual level, but I think that there's whole research areas that suffer right. when there's never, never happened because of that. Right, when there's not uh, a, a, some diversity. I, it doesn't have to be parity, but um, but a little diversity. Well, and I think John, and we're going to get to questions here from you all uh, here in a couple minutes. So I hope you're having your questions ready. Uh, I want to get to this last part of your book, John, which I think is really so provocative. I know Gerard, you've done some work in this area as well. Uh, the chapter title is, Should We Care? Uh, in, it, in it, you examine the possible impact of political biases having on the subjects that are researched in the social sciences. Um, you write at one point, and I quote, not many observers doubt that the large and growing body of social and humanistic knowledge would look quite different if conservatives dominated the professoriate. Uh, Gerard, you added in a recent piece in National Affairs, quote, there are good reasons to believe that the lack of viewpoint diversity undermines the scientific research enterprise that is one of the core missions of the university. So Gerard, just to start with you, if we could talk a little bit more specifically about areas, research areas that uh, you believe have not received the attention they deserve, and for those that 
would like to go into those fields or sub-disciplines that carry more of a political weight to them, uh, what isn't being dealt into? It's a, uh, it's a very important question. Uh, let, me, let me return very quickly to a, a topic that uh, is near and dear to John Heights heart and that of many others that John here, John Shields mentioned, confirmation bias. And um, uh, I, I'm a, I have become a big believer that confirmation bias, this tendency of all of us, scholars included, um, to gravitate towards evidence that conforms to our pre-existing beliefs, to have be skeptical of findings and claims that are antagonistic to our pre-existing beliefs. Um, we do try to combat it in our daily lives, just as we try to, you know, e e even if it's impossible to achieve that, it's abolition in any of our cases. And but this is one of those areas where I think we really need to work with the grain of that natural aspect of human beings and our our psychologies rather than wish it away. And the most obvious thing to do in the case like this is to harness um, confirmation bias at universities by harnessing the confirmation bias of people with different views. And what they do as a result is bring skepticism to bear on each other's claims. And that happens mm. in miniature. There, are, There's a lot of heterogeneity within the left. It's worth pointing out the intellectual left is an incredibly diverse and rich thing. Um, a lot of confirmation bias uh, motivates a lot of mutual scrutiny within those sectors. The problem is, you know, who's supplying the broader scrutiny uh, and skepticism. That applies first to research projects, let's say, already exist. You want to make sure that scrutiny is being brought to bear across all of its assumptions and all of its findings and all of its data, not just some of it. Um, but it also, I believe, informs what kinds of topics um, get selected to begin with. I think confirmation bias, in a sense, in, or, a, or a cousin of it, works in exactly the same way, um, such that a lot of liberal and progressive scholars say to themselves, look, my, I, I find certain kinds of view, you know, views, interpretations, findings, biases, um, attitudes so objectionable. I think it's important to research where they come from and why. And, so, and a lot of other things, conservative intuitions are not nearly as often develop into research agendas. Um, and in the article that you mentioned in National Affairs, um, last fall, um, I pinpointed, I think I, I picked several examples. This could be done across many disciplines. The simple answer is we don't even know many, many, many research areas in history and sociology and anthropology that don't even exist because there's no one to have developed them. And what isn't fair is to ask the lone, the dozen sociologists to have developed that research agenda all by themselves. It's a very rare, you know, Hayek or whomever who develops an entire, spawns an entire research area. I know I'm not capable of doing it. Very few uh, intellectuals are. Are. And one problem when you're re a real minority within a discipline is, so to speak, you don't even know what to work on. If you wanted to do research that reflected some sort of your more visceral values, but do it in a rigorous and serious, inquisitive way, you might not even know where to start. Right? Notice how that isn't an issue in economics or the law, where there are a lot of people that, whose views we might share. They develop big research agendas, and you do what most scholars do, add incrementally to them and get some guidance from the entire field as to, ooh, what would be a good next piece to add? What's the next brick in a given scholarly wall? Um, the problem is that in many cases, we don't even know, and I certainly would say of most disciplines within the social sciences, um, I, I wouldn't be capable of uh, articulating all the fields of research that we don't know. But let, let, let me just pick one, sorry, and I'll shut, shut up there, um, that I mentioned in my National Affairs article. Think of the extent across multiple social science disciplines to which, um, the extent to which we study race and racial attitudes in particular. Bigotry, prejudice of all kinds is a massive industry. That's not a bad or odd thing. Prejudice matters. It's shaped American history and that of many other countries. It's something that ought to be studied a lot. It's a conservative intuition that a couple of other psychological and cultural attitudes have mattered enormously to political history. Guilt um, and envy. Find me any serious research agenda that reflects those intuitions in the social sciences, even to debunk those intuitions. There's just virtually nothing out there to reflect that. These are intuitions that conservatives of many different stripes have had across many countries for centuries, and there's no robust research agenda to reflect those two intuitions. Mm. I'm not saying that research would validate them. I don't know. I know that we don't know. Mm. Sam Abrams, your, yeah. your thoughts, and you mentioned before the changes you made in your own research and interest pre-tenure and post-tenure and whether it's on, on where things are placed or research interests, just uh, your thoughts on, on this question of, of how bias is actually shaping what we know about the world. Sure. Uh, I mean, I, I, th I think it is. I mean, as a graduate of uh, the Inequality and Social Policy Program, there were 
informal rules and formal norms of what I could talk about, what I couldn't talk about. There were whole areas of uh, inquiry that people like me can't talk about. I, I grew up in uh, West Philadelphia. It uh, was a neighborhood that saw huge structural and racial change. I'd like to investigate that in greater detail. I can't. Hmm. It, it's, it's not possible for me to do that and, and, and survive as an academic. I, I don't. I would like to know what's going on. I, I think I, I could do that, but the minute I do that, I will be told I'm not the right background to do that sort of work, uh, or have the right ideology, or, or things of that sort. Uh, but how, able how could they stop you? I mean, you're a tenured professor. Oh, now they can't. I could certainly yeah. try it now. Good luck getting it published. National Affairs wouldn't publish it? Yeah, I don't get I, any scholarly I, credit I, for that. And I, yes, and that's... You felt, don't care, you get tenure. Sure, now I don't. But earlier, if I were interested in that... It, you know, God forbid Sam might want to get promoted. Uh, and I'm that, good. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, exactly. No, it, it, it's very, very hard to do it. I, I have four or five articles about the state of higher education. I have attempted to get these things placed for the last three years. I wrote a piece uh, paying homage to uh, Marty Lipset actually, and, and wanted to continue his work. It was rejected by two dozen peer-reviewed sources, and uh, you know, I, I redacted it a bunch, uh, shrunk it, and now you know, the American interest took it. But I don't get academic credit for that. Mm. My colleagues don't regard it as a, of any value. Uh, don't really care because, again, having tenure is, is great. I can just get the ideas out, which is really important. Mm. But if the idea is to move the academy and to move Students, you know, we, we have to have a foot in, in, in both worlds, both the, the academic world and the, the, you know, political or policy spheres, and it's becoming increasingly uh, hard to do that, I, I find. Um, you know, you can certainly write certain articles and, and place them, but I'm not so sure anyone's going to, you know, in, in the academy is going to read them. Well, can, can I just say that? I, yeah, I mean, and then we'll get, go to questions. If, from if they the don't other. get published mm -hmm. in peer reviewed journals, screw them. I mean, well, that's I, what we're doing, Ron. Right. <laughs> so, uh, Look, and if we go back to where academe was in the 50s and 60s, we did not have this preoccupation with peer-reviewed journals all the time and pa publishing in university presses. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at a lot of the, the really interesting and sort of path-breaking stuff that was done in social sciences in the 50s and 60s was places like free press and basic books. And, and I think um, to some extent we need, you know, particularly once you got, before you got tenure, you gotta be careful, got it. But, but I think once you have tenure, I mean, it's incumbent upon those of us who are sort of conservatives in academe that we be fairly aggressive about getting our ideas out there, however we're going to get our ideas out there. And if our colleagues don't like it, tant pis. Uh, and, you know, we, sh we should just do it. I, I mean, I, I think, I, I do worry about us feeling like victims in some way, or mm. you know, feeling constraints that don't actually exist once you have tenure. Before mm. tenure, there are constraints. After tenure, there's very little they can do to you. But it, isn't it fair to say, though, uh, Professor Cohen, that to go through that experience of submitting to several dozen academic journals, isn't there well, something, I mean, we, we can complain about that. Well, of course right? you, can com you can complain about it, but listen, we have wonderful jobs. Yeah. You know, we get, to, yeah. we get to read the books we want to read. We get mm -hmm. to teach students. We get to mold young people. We get, you know, we have an enormous amount of leisure, and we've got incredible freedom. So, okay, the price you pay is a little frustration. I mean, I've, I've had it my own ways as well, but I, I just think we should, I'd, I'd like us to have a kind of a, you know, sit up straight and, you know, fight the good fight. See how happy he is, Sam? That's quick one. quick follow up of I would just say ending the victim idea is, is, yeah. is actually a very important point. And I'm not, I'm not trying to sound like a victim. I'm trying to share certain ideas right. here about the trouble. No, I don't feel like a victim at all. S screw the presses. I'm going to put it out the way I need to put it out there. But, you know, but, I guess but, the idea but, is to just share that but, it's hard to get But this two out and five and ten years later, mm -hmm. that piece probably won't make it on a graduate student syllabi right. because it wasn't in a peer yes. reviewed journal. As ridiculous as what it, you're saying it, is, yes. And that's not saying, but yes, it needs yeah. to be in that sort of canon. Let's go to questions from the audience. I believe we have uh, Rebecca with a microphone. Uh, two. Uh, two. Okay, first up front here. Um, okay. Could you give your name and affiliation? I'm Knox Brown. I'm at the indoctrination factory at UCLA. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Senator Rubio. John Shields, you mentioned earlier that there's something about the moral culture of selective universities that 
engenders the outrage culture. Could you elaborate? Yeah, I, I think it's, uh, at, at the most, um, I think there's a kind of, um, at the most egalitarian schools that are most com committed to egalitarianism, um, you get a, um, you know, you've, get, you've gotten all this uh, sort of concern, I think, about uh, 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 offending, right, uh, off give, giving offense to others, you've got stuff on, all the stuff, with space space, safe spaces and microaggressions. Um, and it's a culture that can be censorious. I mean, that, that does encourage self-censorship. Um, the truth is we know very little about it empirically because despite the fact that there's lots of climate surveys at universities, none of them ask students questions like, do you feel comfortable expressing your own views in the classroom? Um, the one exception to this is at the University of Colorado uh, where uh, I think it was in the wake of the War Churchill uh, uh, nonsense uh, that the uh, the regions freaked out and demanded that uh, there was this, uh, demanded a climate survey that really just asked students, you know, do you feel comfortable expressing your views in the classroom? Mm. Um, and it did find that there were, um, uh, you know, that there were political differences here. So the, so the very conservative students, Republican students, uh, felt less comfortable expressing their views. Uh, but had this survey been done at a very elite liberal arts college, like um, some of the colleges um, I know, like Scripps College or Pomona College, um, I suspect you'd find very high numbers of students who feel uncomfortable. Um, and I think it's worse there, uh, actually. My guess is it's actually better at a place like UCLA, um, at these bigger institutions, because uh, I think at the smaller elite liberal arts colleges, you do get, they become sort of like churches, you know, and so there's this great pressure on conformity and, and uh, and uh, it's almost as if they're trying to reestablish, I think, a kind of a kind of religion, right? And uh, um, but I, frankly, I don't know. Um, you know, outside of uh, the very selective institutions, I don't. I, my guess is this culture isn't very strong, right? I don't think it's. I, I don't think it just down the road from you at Cal State San Bernardino. My guess is there's very little of this. Hmm. Yes. Yes, um, uh, Pat Spann. I. Um, been wondering for years. I'm a, a Proctor of the 60s. I graduated in, in the 60s from college. And um, I'm wondering if, if the, the left would swing in the 60s and you know, the utopians, the new left, the anti war types. Is that the momentum for all this growth? I know I personally, I graduated from a, my peers considered a very reactionary uh, school, uh, West Point, obviously, <laughs> uh, still. And I volunteered for Vietnam, so that made me very strange with my peers. But the. Um, <laughs> I guess, it, 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 is there, seems to me that that's what's happened, is that people s start, stayed in school, I don't know whether to avoid the draft or whatever, but just stayed in school and stayed in school and the, the, the more left-wingers. And also I just throw out, I remember in the 60s always being told those that can do, do, and those that can't teach. And I, um, I, I, I having observed it over the years, is that is really the 60s, is that the impetus for the, um, left-wing momentum. Dr. Cole? Um, I'm, I'm not going to try to address that directly, but I think it's, it's important to, to remember that uh, the question of intellectual generations is actually pretty complicated. Mm. So in other words, I wouldn't simplify it, just say, okay, you know, all those leftists who couldn't do anything became a bunch of professors, and they're still poisoning the minds of the youth uh, in now in the early 21st century. Now, Bill Ayers aside. Yeah, I mean, Bill Ayers aside. And, you know, plenty of other people I could mention. But I'm poisoning the kids' minds in other directions. Um, but you do have interesting shifts. So, for example, I mean, where I see this is in area studies. So it used to be if you had people doing Middle East studies, the thing that obsessed them was the Arab-Israeli conflict. And you had a majority who would be very pro-Palestinian, and you'd have a minority that would be very pro-Israeli, and... And, and that's why it was a really rotten field for a long time. Uh, what's now happening is it's changing. And it's changing because you're getting more people who are not actually particularly interested in the Arab-Israeli conflict. They're more interested in doing empirical work in the Arab world. There are all kinds of interesting things going on. So you have a different generation of Middle East specialists. You have different generations of China experts because the, the generation of China experts that I grew up with, first you could see the old one, the really old ones have been missionaries' kids. 
Then you got a generation that was used to kind of peering at China from Hong Kong and Taiwan. And so they had a very different kind of mindset about this remote and exotic place that they could never really visit. Now you get lots and lots of people who've spent lots of time in China, really know the language. They're, they're interested in a very different set of issues. So I think it, the university world is incredibly rich and diverse. And there are intellectual generations that will pass through. And, and I just think we should be careful about reducing it all to you know, the left of the 70s, really, in some ways more than the 60s, you know, just kind of going, going through the system and eventually dominating it. Yes, here in front in the blue, second row. Thanks. My name is Bonnie Wachtel. Uh, in the 1970s, I was at Chicago, and even then the professors leaned left, true communists, some of them, but it didn't matter because they were so obsessed with teaching classic texts and really bringing out the ideas, maybe a, a different intellectual generation. So I'm a little soft on that topic. But in the current day, this persecution and the suppression of ideas, this is something totally different than anything the left was doing when I was on campus. And my particular question is, I was, I was reliably told by someone who works at the Federalist Society, maybe just with respect to the law schools, but he said it is, it is at the point that a number of the left-leaning faculty are getting very concerned about this themselves. And I wonder if any of you would like to either support or not support that statement. John? Yeah, I, I think it's true. I mean, in a way, they have it. Uh, they have it worse, uh, in insofar as their the left is uh, leftist professors are much more likely to be teaching courses on race and gender and topics that are likely to get them in hot water with students, whereas the conservatives are off teaching microeconomics, and so they're less likely uh, to get a lot of flack from students. So I think they're in some ways on the front lines of this. They're really seeing the illiberalism, uh, but it's also really dividing them. And I think uh, particularly on the one side, you have a, a number of humanities professors. Often they're uh, suspicious of the Enlightenment. You know, they're disciples of Foucault. Uh, so they see, you know, they see the university not as an institution that should pursue truth, but as one in which, you know, just another um, uh, a place to sort of fight over power. And, and so those, those folks, uh, I think, have become badly divided uh, from you know, sort of most center-left professors who, um, you know, believe in reason and the Enlightenment and um, are, are quite concerned about these developments. So I think that's true. And I think in the case of Chicago, I think Chicago is, a, was a, is sort of a special place. I mean, it's an usually intellectual place. It's been at the forefront of resisting uh, these, um, you know, these illiberal currents on campus right now. Uh, and so I think it's, it's distinctive in that way. Um, and in terms of, you know, comparing students today versus, yes, uh, versus the 60s, um, I think in some ways, uh, when I read about the students in the late 60s, I find them much more alarming. I mean, those folks wanted to burn the university right. to the ground. They saw right. nothing redeemable in the university. Right. Um, they saw it as a platform for their revolution. Whereas today, I think these students, um, like the university, they see it as a sanctuary from the rest of the world, almost inver almost the opposite of the late 60s. Right. And, and they want to, you know, they want more administrators and, you know, they... That they, they about something, the Vietnam War. This yeah. is about nothing. Mm. Mm. Let, let me take a momentary issue with, with that. I, I think one of the things that I, I think plays a role in the illiberal moment we're in, on, on, in among some scholars and students on some maybe even many faculties, uh, universities, is that uh, one has to keep in mind what they think they're trying to accomplish, what it is in, in particular that they're combating. And I think it's worth pointing out that the left of the left in the United States has developed an understanding of conservative politics that portrays conservatives as, uh, as, as monstrous. Right? Conservatism in, it, in their understandings in modern times is coterminous with bigotry. It is the politics of sort of mobilized white anger. 
it's the politics of um, you know hatred of women. Of it's the it's the opposition to the rights. It's defined by opposition to the rights revolution of the 1960s and 70s. It wants to destroy the earth. It's in the corp corp pockets of corporate interests. I mean, if there is an evil that it's not associated with, I I, just, I missed that memo. Um, and if you really believe that, then you know this is something that to many of them that you have to do something about. That having Ann Coulter on campus is not merely um, rude, it's downright dangerous. And that she is you know, carrying in her wake, as are many others, uh, something profoundly harmful, very threatening to the mm. constitutional order, to liberties, to a whole host of things. And I do think that's why that there, I do expect some intensification under the current administration, because Trump seems to sort of embody, even for many moderately liberal scholars, the sort of Some worst conservatives stereotypes. too. Yeah, um, uh, and the, the, the sort of worst. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, it, it, he seems to fulfill all of their most alarmist and darkest understandings of what conservatism is. And I think until a more uh, notice how self-reinforcing this is. Um, right, not many conservatives on campus to present a non-monstrous uh, understanding of what that is. And, and the, the whole dynamic becomes an extremely you know, vicious circle. I'll just add two, and this was one of the remarks that was made by a, another one of the students interviewed for that New York Times piece from Monday that I mentioned before, that there's this connection made between language and violence, right? right. That, that language is of its very nature violence. And so you can be done violence too just by someone having a contrary opinion to what you have. And apparently that is a generally understood opinion on many college campuses. The sticks and stones distinction is really eroded. Right. In all seriousness, it yeah. really has. And I don't think we fully understand why that happened. It's but because there is, we've been bringing people up to be wimps. Yeah. But th there's the victim. Because they, because they yeah. don't understand the difference between words and, and a punch in the jaw. I, I mean, as long as I've got the, the platform, you know, you mentioned the, um, the Federalist Society. You know, I I'm, I'm, have some familiarity with law schools, but not a huge amount. The, you know, the, what's striking, actually, is the success of the Federalist Society. That's the real story in the law schools. I mean, you have a whole network of conservative lawyers, conservative judges, which did not exist 40 or 50 years ago, and that is self-reinforcing, and that is, has actually been, on, I would say, on the whole, extraordinarily successful. So. You know, I think that what we should do with, with things like that is think about, okay, uh, does the Federal Society offer some sort of model? Something like that, the Alexander Hamilton Society has basically tried to take the, the Federal Society model, apply it to American foreign policy and international relations with some, with some success, I think. But, you know, again, I'm just- And we've seen that here too. I mean, too much. values in capitalism, the AEI undergraduate right. chapter, ISI, mm -hmm. IHS, as you mentioned before, Pepperdine School of Public the, Policy. The, I'm just in waxing the, here. In, in, <laughs> in the spirit of provocation, I'll, I'll offer um, a partial Thank defense you, of uh, student protesters, which is that many of them seem to perceive accurately, I think, um, a kind of spiritual emptiness uh, to the modern university. Um, they are promised a transformative experience, and you see this in uh, the brochures and, and the literature. And when they arrive, they find um, faculty who are primarily interested in their own research and administrators who speak the language of competency and opportunity. They, they are asking mm. important questions, and they're not getting answers. And I think mm. that some of the emotional energy that gets diverted uh, into protest comes from justified disappointment um, that our universities are not doing what they should be doing and that they are unable to provide any justification for their own existence. Although in defense of the, I, yeah, I think that's uh, interesting. I, I think in defense though of the universities, it could be that there's something about this uh, pursuit of truth which uh, thrives when you have diverse ideas and these ideas are mm. um, offensive, right? Um, is that there's something inherently, it doesn't satisfy our tribal nature, right? To say, look, we're gonna go into an institution and this institution is about truth seeking and truth seeking requires this broad range of views 
Um, and these views are inherently offensive because we're talking about competing conceptions of the good. Uh, isn't, I guess my question would be, is there something about this that doesn't satisfy, in some sense, our more religious or tribal nature? I, I, I think, I think that's, that's possibly true, but I mm. don't even think that universities mm. say that. Um, that I, I think a first step um, would be to state the commitment of universities to precisely that kind of controversy and precisely that kind of inquiry, um, which at their best programs like the core curriculum at the University of Chicago have done. Mm -hmm. um, universities don't do that. So it's not tribalism mm -hmm. in opposition to, to that debate and, and conflict. Right. It's, it's tribalism in opposition to nothing. Mm -hmm. Second in. Uh, my name is Christopher Goffis, and I work at this infamous Federalist Society you, you keep speaking of. Uh, I, I don't speak for them. Um, so I, I'm trying to understand um, the importance of political diversity to teaching. So I, I think Gerard Alexander's case that political diversity is important to research uh, because of confirmation bias is very convincing. Um, but on the, the, the other side of being a faculty member, the classroom side, um, you know, I, I, I wonder if, if it's more important for uh, professors to approach the classroom with a certain um, idea of, and I hate to use the adjective, but true liberal education. Um, so uh, John mentioned um, you know, the Cornell West, Robbie George method of teaching. Uh, you know, Gerard set up his classroom as a debate. Sam Goldman talks about how his goal is to, to expand his students beyond the traditional left-right dichotomy. Um, and you know, these places like, uh, I, I think you mentioned Hillsdale College and, and George Mason, and we could throw a few, few dozen other school, smaller schools into that boat of being characteristically conservative. Um, so with these character, characteristically conservative colleges, should we worry about them being overloaded with conservative professors for the sake of the students, um, as long as they're taking uh, you know, more of a traditional liberal education approach to how they teach? On that. Well, I, I think so. in the long run, if there's, if there's a great imbalance, what they teach is going to be shaped by that imbalance, right? So, the, so, so if, I was, if I wanted to teach um, <coughs> the Cold War, right, I mean, it seems to me it would be really easy to um, miss uh, lots of interesting voices because that whole area, right, or if I wanted to teach the history of American communism, um, I might miss lots of interesting readings, right, that uh, sort of center-right readings, uh, because the whole discipline, it seems to me, has been shaped by people who have been sympathetic uh, to, to Russia and communism. Um, so I think that, in so imbalances, you know, uh, affect the, the whole body of knowledge that, um, that gets passed on uh, from generation to generation. So, um, so in that sense, the balance, uh, th those imbalances matter. But I'm sympathetic broadly to the view that, um, that of course, that, you know, uh, that center, that, that, that liberal and conservative professors can, um, can, um, can, you know, expose students but to a wide range of, of views and do it uh, seriously and, and fairly, I, th I think that's true. I, I would say that you need both, uh, because uh, you know conservative uh, faculty uh, can be just as restrictive on free inquiry as a liberal faculty. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, think about these think tanks, right? You know, they sponsor only certain kinds of research, okay, and it's a, the type of research that they can get support for, um, and that their donors, you know, want to see. You know, if I were to approach uh, one of the big think tanks in town here uh, with a project to address the immoral usury associated with payday lending, they'd laugh me right out of the building. If I wanted to address the social ills associated with casino gambling, again, they would laugh me right out of the building. Uh, and that has to do with where, where they get their money and what kinds of things they want to tolerate. So that seems like, you know, restrictions on free inquiry that I might, even, might not even have at the university, where I'm free to investigate those things if I want to. I, I also think, you know, to some extent, good, look, a good teacher does not think that they're in the business of indoctrination. And a good teacher will bend over backwards to, you know, if only to kind of shake up uh, and unnerve the students, you know, force them to consider different points of view. 
Well, I think at the end of the day, if you're in a homogeneous uh, political culture, be it of the left or in a few cases like the ones you mentioned of the right, it's going to be, it's harder to do that. But, you know, I had some wonderful teachers who were on the left. I had some wonderful teachers who were on the right. And what they had in common was that they were not interested in indoctrinating me. They were interested in making me think more clearly. And I think there are a lot of committed teachers out there. You know, again, it's why I, I bristle at the kind of Wall Street Journal wholesale trashing of the universities. There are a lot of very dedicated teachers out there. It's also worth remembering that um, viewpoint diversity can be institutional as well as individual. And one of the great glories of American higher education is that we have all sorts of colleges and universities, mm -hmm. um, a variety that really isn't found anywhere else in, in the world. So um, let, let Hillsdale be Hillsdale and let Oberlin be Oberlin. That, that also um, is an important kind of diversity. Mm -hmm. Yes, here in the back. Yep, second row in. Hi, um, thank you all so much. My name is Marissa Bailey, and I work here at AEI, and I also graduated from Pepperdine University. Um, so my question is, at Pepperdine political science classes, even if the class was very decisive or politically diverse, Pepperdine advocates a faith-based education so we all, all kind of shared that outside of the classroom and we're very tolerant of one another's beliefs. And I know Professor um, Goldman mentioned a spiritual emptiness. Do you think there's like a literal spiritual emptiness where is there any empirical evidence between increasing secularization of campuses and this political divisiveness and partisanship? John, you've done some <laughs> writing on this issue um, more broadly. Well, the, I mean, there, there's, there's not a lot of, uh, I mean, these protests certainly aren't happening at religious colleges, and I suppose that fits um, Sam's uh, theory to an extent, right? Maybe, maybe there's some sort of, um, th those institutions meet students' spiritual needs. The other thing I would say about religious colleges, though, is they're also much more politically diverse, on average, than secular colleges, right? So if you want to encounter uh, a politically diverse professoriate, it's much better to go to Wheaton College than uh, you know UCLA, um, and so um, so yeah. So religious college. I mean, there's exceptions, right? I mean, Liberty University or some fundamentalist colleges, but a lot of religious colleges um, cheat a little bit better on the diversity score. Uh, Baylor leaps to mind. Notre Dame, uh, some of the Catholic schools too. Also, an impact just on that note on on the research as well. Mm -hmm. the, the, not just the left-right divide, but also the secular faith divide. Um, one of the questions I didn't ask here, but there was a, one quotation from your book, John, was from Christian Smith, a sociologist, as you know, from Notre Dame. And he was talking about the religious awakenings in the 70s and 80s mm -hmm. uh, and how they were covered by those in his discipline. He said this, quote, so just when sociology was most needed to make good sense of a born-again president, the Iranian revolution, mm -hmm. liberation theology, a world-transforming Catholic pope, the religious right, Poland's Catholic Solidarność movement, and I'll just cut the list short because he goes on. <laughs> he concludes, quote, few in sociology possessed any of the right conceptual theoretical tools to make sense of the political one-sidedness. It manifests itself in many ways in the intellectual monocultures that have taken over certain disciplines to the demand to disinvite speakers. So that's another dimension of this as well, um, uh, the, the role that faith plays in the shaping of events and policy. And that is something that Lisa uh, Smith has wrote, written on, on many occasions is something that's missing from the vast majority of literature coming out of uh, many of the social sciences. We have time for a couple more questions here, second row in. Uh, thanks, my name is Wilson and I also work at AEI. Um, there's obviously some viewpoint diversity on the panel, but what do you think the effect of having a more left-leaning professor um, would have been on the conversation? It would have called us out on more silly things, probably. No, I mean, it would have been good. I, I, for one thing, it would have depend whether it's a more liberal or illiberal professor. I mean, right. It, right. In our panel in San Francisco, we had uh, the dean of Cal's Goldman School of Public Policy, Henry Brady, who's a friend of mine, and definitely more a man of the left. But the reason he wanted to participate 
was because it's been discussed on this panel, and I really do think it's one of the very important parts of the understanding of this subject is that many on the left are really seeing that the pendulum has swung way too far. I mean, the, the point before that you raised, uh, Miss, about the uh, University of Chicago and the growing awareness on the left, I mean, that's John Haidt's story, right? And how he has become much more involved in this as a self-described person on the left, he has seen that the pendulum has swung too far. Sam, did you have a... Yeah, I mean, I'm not so sure Henry is, is I would call him a lefty. I would no, I wouldn't say lefty, a, but... Oh, no, no, I mean, so. I think of him as more of a, a centrist. I, I think yep. there's an age cohort effect here that we would need to consider. I mean, if I brought a colleague from NYU, Columbia, New School, or Sarah Lawrence here under the age of 50, I think it, we would be attacked for being, God only knows, uh, racist, homophobic, homophobic, bigoted somehow. Just by, I mean, just by the composition of the panel itself. Uh, so, I mean, I, I do think there is an age cohort issue here. I, I, I mean, I think Henry is much more reasonable as, as a human being, too. Yeah. I mean, he's, yeah. and, and that's the thing. He's actually a true social scientist. He goes where the data right. leaves. I think one of my big issues, uh, especially in the liberal arts world, and I appreciate Sam's differentiation here because I don't think we made that clear enough, that there's a large universe of about 6,000 colleges and universities in, the, in this country, and there's incredible differentiation from the big R1 research universities where, yeah, the faculty really care about publishing or perishing to small liberal arts colleges where it doesn't really matter how much you publish if you do great, but you know, how committed are you to your classroom, how committed are you to your, your students, and to the community as a whole, and that's the metric that really matters. So there are these differences, and I think if we were to bring someone from one of those sorts of places, any of the liberal arts colleges, it would look and sound very uh, different in here. So, you know, in Henry's case, he's, a, he's an empiricist and a, and a true social scientist who may lean a little to the left, but I don't think it would change that much. But yeah, I, I think that, the, you know, I, I think you'd see a there might be some more defensiveness on, on the panel, and, and, and quite frankly, there we would be called uh, close-minded, and, and we wouldn't be called. You know, people would say you're not you're, you know, you're not thinking in a structuralist way, and there are these inherent institutional problems, and, and so on. That is sort of the vernacular and sort of the language we hear from them constantly on liberal arts college campuses. So, so one of the things we now need is uh, for John and one of his co-authors, you know, to go out and survey. 150 or 200 liberal faculty members, right? <laughs> um, because I think you might be surprised to hear that um, liberal faculty members complain about their work being rejected because of ideological bias as well, okay? And I think that's quite interesting that if we had um, more variation in the study or we went out and did a second study, we might be surprised, okay, at just how many um, liberal complaints mirror the conservative complaints. Now maybe that makes them all just rationalizations, right, for failure on other grounds. I don't know. But it's, it's something that needs to be done. And that was my point earlier with some of the left eating the other left. You know, is this the right construct? Is this the right construct? How do you adjudicate all of that? And, and uh, it's pretty contentious on the left, which is why I think the data shows that in many cases folks who are left are a little less satisfied compared to the folks on the right when they're on the professorate. Sorry, okay, yeah. We have time for one more question here. In Hi, um, my name is Lena. I just graduated last year from Claremont McKenna College, where Professor Shields teaches, um, and I work for the Hertog Foundation right now. Um, so I wanted to go back to the point about you know ideas or violence because I think that's key to sort of the difficulty of any sort of implementation of political diversity, I guess within the professor, but also like within the student body, because you know um, the Heather McDonald protests that occurred. Like one of the positions that the protesters were taking was that her arguments are literally violent. Like like by by you know by speaking at the Athenaeum mm -hmm. and you know giving those points, she's literally committing violence. Mm -hmm. And if you have people who believe that genuinely. You know, they're not going to see political diversity as a good thing because they're going to see you as like a proponent of violence. And, you know, how, how do you engage with students who hold those ideas? How do I engage with my peers? You know, if, if I, you know, if I, to use that topic that was thrown out there just now, like I talk about like the good, the good side of gentrification and people, you know, my, 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 my peer tells me like, oh, that's, that's a violent idea. Like, you shouldn't bring it up. Um, or, you know, if, if I hand in this paper to this professor, who thinks that this idea is violent and so gives me an F because it's, you know, it's, it's not morally acceptable to turn in this paper. Like, how, how, do I, how do I even begin to, like, push for political diversity, like, as a student? So. 
So, so the good yeah. news is sooner or later they're going to leave Claremont McKenna and they'll go into the real world where <laughs> that kind of nonsense doesn't fly. And, you know, reality is a teacher too. And they'll encounter reality and, you know, they'll run into a brick wall and my guess is they'll, they'll adjust their views. I, I, you know, this point has been made by other people. It's not uh, original to me. One of the differences between the protesters now and the protesters then is the protesters now want the grown-ups to protect them and to shield them from distress. And I have to say, I think some of this is political, but some of this also just has to do with parenting, you know, <laughs> with the kind of ridiculous hovering and protectiveness that we have of our kids. And that actually, I suspect conservative parents are probably not a whole lot better on that than, uh, than liberal parents are. So I think, again, we, you know, we should, I think we have to be a little bit careful about associating this phenomenon simply with politics. It, it has to do with other things as well, I believe. I would also just add, I, I think that connection between voice, speech, and violence is obviously in part the subject of this discussion, but I really think that it's a fad. Uh, I think over time, and, and that's why you're beginning to see people on the left and academics on the left really stand up and say the pendulum really has swung too far. And unfortunately, there are going to be students like you that are having to go through this now. But if there's any hope, I really don't think that this is a set of ideas uh, that are sustainable. And let, let, let me inject a slightly more pessimistic note. Thank um, you, Gerard. Professor Cohen. We're closing yeah, with it. It, seem, it seems right. Uh, <laughs> it, it, Professor Cohen is confident that when students leave campuses like Claremont's and go out into the real world, they're going to sort of get a sort of you know cold bucket of water and have to have to grow up. So let me put it this way: How many of us are really that confident? that big bureaucratic corporate America is going to listen to these demands for protection and other progressive measures and tell them absolutely not. This is a tough, competitive, ruthless world and sorry, we're not going to build a lot of human resources and other practices around your political agendas. We're, we're, comfortable, we're confident they're going to say that? Because I think they've been busy not if doing that Google, for the last 20 Facebook, years. If you look at Facebook, a lot of the, yeah. a lot right. of the homeland generation we, newer companies. So, it, I, so I, my, my personal fear I, is these I things are going to be they'll, carried they'll, they'll right over into a lot of other American institutions. You know, that, know. They, they, they'll do that until they actually, and like, like Amazon is really kind of soft and sweet and indulgent and gives people spaces to cry. I don't think so. Uber, Uber, they're really kind of But they're sweet. still chasing the money. Amazon has trouble attracting people compared to some of these other companies. Right, but you know what? I mean, the, the other places are going to encounter uh, trouble as well. I, I don't know. I, I guess I know. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe Silicon Valley is a, a special place, but I think if you work at <laughs> it a, is that. If you work at UPS <laughs> or FedEx or, you know, I don't know what other industry. I just, you know, from friends of mine who are in the world of business, let, let alone small business, which after all is where a lot of people end up. You know, I don't actually encounter a whole lot of well, that. Well, let me, let me close on an upbeat note. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I, I really, you know, this, the subject of this panel and the work that you, you all are doing and the other panels that we've been doing and the work that a place like AEI does and obviously we're trying to do at Pepperdine is in response to this. And in part, I really believe what... Mike McConnell said at our last panel from Stanford Law, it's the liberal students who are not getting a real liberal arts education from going through this. And maybe to echo a little bit about what, from what Dr. Cohen is saying, that professor might not be going outside of that bubble. But as students do increasingly, and as more people are being made aware, I think, I think actually the protests and what happened to Heather McDonald, what happened to Charles Murray, these are the kinds of protests that are actually uh, provoking people on the left to say, you know what, what I always just kind of thought was just kind of a, a quiet leftist institution is really spilling out into the streets. And a, a little bit of a deeper dive into where those ideas come from, we've obviously explored those to some degree this afternoon, but also uh, hearing student testimonies like yours, I think it's increasingly important that students like you speak up. Um, because frankly, uh, those voices aren't heard enough. Uh, we've heard from uh, faculty, but I think really what's going to be important is for students like you, you and others, as we're in this in-between time between where that 
understanding of speech as violence or an idea as violence is extant to when it dies, and it will die. Uh, it will die because students like you are going to step forward and say, this is shutting down my free speech. And so I'm actually very hopeful um, over the next five or 10 years. And when you start to see these left-right coalitions begin to build like Heterodox Academy, uh, it's coming both from the ground up and from the top down. And I really do believe uh, that the conversations like this one are important uh, to moving this issue forward. So I wanna thank everyone for coming out uh, this afternoon. I wanna thank our panel here. Please join me in thanking them. Uh, in particular, I want to thank the folks at AEI who have been so much fun to work with. I want to thank you, Ryan. Great to meet you. Uh, Rebecca Ritchie, thank you. Great working with you. And Suzanne Gershowitz, I see, is in the back. Uh, so many great people here. And, uh, and I'm so grateful uh, for this partnership with the School of Public Policy. And I think James Q. Wilson is looking down on us rather happily today. So we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.